Hi, I'm Dr. J, and this is a video about multiple regression. This video exists within a playlist up here all about regression models. As usual, down below there is a PDF version of these slides. We're going to be introducing, at a high level, multiple regression models, and in this video, describing two particular examples of multiple regression models just to try to fix ideas. In a subsequent video, we'll be talking about interaction terms and how we can expand multiple regression models even farther. All right, as a reminder, when we have a regression model, we have this structure in terms of our setup. We have a response variable y that are independent, normally distributed, with some mean mu i and a constant variance sigma squared. If we have a simple linear regression model, then that mean the mu i is simply beta naught plus beta 1 times xi, usually in that case referred to beta naught as the intercept and beta 1 as the slope. Because if x is continuous, as we've seen in previous videos, then we will have a nice line that describes our data. When we move on to multiple regression models, what we do is we simply add on additional explanatory variables. And because we have additional explanatory variables, we have to start numbering them. So you'll notice that the xi has now changed to xi1, and then we've now added on to that mean plus beta 2 xi2 plus beta 3 times xi3 and so forth on up to some endpoint beta p xip. So in this context, for a particular observation i, the yi is going to be our response variable and xip is going to be our p explanatory variable. And so we're going to now talk about what are the different choices we can have for these explanatory variables x, i. Right? And so we have lots of flexibility within this model structure because we have a lot of flexibility in our choices for what those x, i's are. In a previous video, we've seen uh, the use of functions of the explanatory variables that we have. In particular, we were talking about uh, logarithms and taking logs of our explanatory variables, but we'll see in this slide another possible uh, function that we could use. Also in a previous video we talked about using categorical variables that is to introduce these dummy variables that indicate the different levels of that categorical variable. I'm not going to repeat that here because we've already talked about that in the previous video. Uh, we're going to talk about something that are generally talked about as higher order terms and in particular uh, we're first going to just be looking at functions of a single explanatory variable uh, in terms of squared and cubic terms. We're going to talk about adding additional explanatory variables into our model. And then in the next video, we'll introduce the idea of interaction where you take your explanatory variables and you multiply them. And when you do that, there are many different ways that you can. If you have two continuous explanatory variables, then you simply just actually multiply them. But if you don't, if you have one that's continuous and one that's categorical, then you can't really multiply the categorical, but we'll talk about um, what this idea means for that situation when one of the variables is categorical, and we'll also talk about the situation where they are both categorical. All right, so um, the first thing I want to talk about is the model and the parameter interpretation within this multiple regression model. All right, so we talked about the interpretation previously for a simple linear regression model, but now it gets a little bit more complicated when we have a multiple regression model. But the intercept stays pretty much the same. So beta naught, which we might refer to as the intercept, uh, is just the expected response when all of the explanatory variables are zero. You can see up in the equation up here, if you just simply plugged in zero every place that you saw one of the x's, right, then all the rest would disappear and we'd be just left with a beta naught for that mean. So beta naught is that expected response when all of the explanatory variables are zero. Now we can think about, well, how do we interpret the other betas, the other coefficients in this multiple regression model? And it, the way that we interpret them is to say, all right, uh, a particular beta, say beta 1, that beta is the expected increase in the response when that associated explanatory variable increases by 1 when all the other explanatory variables are held constant. Right? So for beta 1, for instance, if you increased x1 by 1, right, that would be the expected increase in the response, but you'd have to keep x2 through xp the same. Okay? Then the other thing is to, to interpret the uh, r squared. The r squared is simply the proportion 
of the variability in the response described by the model. Okay. And so the main purpose of this video and the next video is to try to get an understanding for what this interpretation means in the context of different models. One of the things you'll see is that we can't always hold all the other explanatory variables constant. So sometimes that is just kind of a meaningless, uh, the parameters don't have the interpretation that we might want them to have. Right? In other contexts, we'll see that uh, that interpretation only holds in certain circumstances. And so we'll try to go through those different examples and try to uh, introduce the idea of parameter interpretation in these different models. Okay, uh, I've got a quick slide here, it may be too small to even see, but I don't really want to get hung up on this, but I just want to tell you that there is a way to estimate parameters and to do inference in these multiple regression models. The simplest way is to use linear algebra, and so this is the model rewritten as a linear algebra model. Um, here, uh, once we have it written up as a linear, uh, not a linear algebra model, but a linear uh, algebra equation, once we have that written up, then we can go through and we can find the least squares estimator, which is also our MLE, which is also our Bayes estimator. Um, and that's going to be given with this equation right here. And we can find other details that are necessary to perform the inference that we're interested in. Eventually, we can construct confidence intervals and credible intervals. We can calculate p-values and posterior probabilities. Uh, and they all rely on these quantities that are right here. And again, now, if you're really interested in this, I encourage you to uh, pause the video or uh, take a look at the PDF and take a look at the equations there. I'm not going to spend more time on them, except to mention the degrees of freedom. If you remember from simple linear regression, the degrees of freedom were n minus 2. When we have multiple regression, you'll see here that the degrees of freedom are n minus p plus 1. And p plus 1 is the number of betas, or number of coefficients, probably better to think about betas, number of betas in the model. Remember we had the equation beta naught plus beta 1 times xi1 plus all the way up to beta p times xip. So we started at 0 and went up to p, so there are p plus 1 of those betas. And so when you're thinking about degrees of freedom, just remember that it's number of observations n minus the number of betas that are in the model. If you think about simple linear regression model, in that model we had a beta naught and a beta 1, and we had therefore 2, that's why we had n minus 2 degrees of freedom. Okay, um, I'm going to get on to now one of the examples. The first example I'm going to be talking about is this particular experiment. Uh, in this experiment, a constant force was given to a ball, uh, but the height was varied, and then the distance away from this box that the ball was launched off of was recorded. And so the data we have looked something like this. So you see the different distances on that x-axis, and then you have the different uh, distances that the ball traveled on the y-axis. So the height is our explanatory variable, and the distance is our response. Now, if we start thinking about how to construct a multiple regression model, uh, first off, if you just look at this picture, you can see it doesn't look like a straight line. right? You see some curvature there. All right? And so we might want to allow for that curvature, and the way that we're going to do it is by adding higher order terms to the model. So here in my notation, I'm going to use yi is the response, and hi is the explanatory variable, that's the height. So I'm using h here instead of x because h relates more to height than using x. All right, and so a simple linear regression model would just be of this structure. That mean is beta naught plus weight of 1 times the height. And now we know from previous videos that that will give us a line. Right? But we saw in the previous figure that a line didn't seem like it represented the data well. So one thing we could try is we could say, well, what if you add a quadratic term? So now we have a plus beta 2 times the height squared. That's now a quadratic model, and it will give us a quadratic curve. We could go a step further, and we could say, what if we added a cubic term? So now we have a plus beta 3 times the height cubed. Okay, And so we're going to take a look at these three models. In R, if we want to fit those models, we do what we did before when we had functions. We just take that I function, which means to evaluate. Uh, in this case, we get height squared. And then in the third model, we have height squared and height cubed. Uh, and you can see here there are the uh, parameter estimates from those models. Now, this picture might be a little bit more meaningful. right? In the top left, we started with just the data. In the top right, we have our simple linear regression model where we only have a linear term for height. 
the bottom left, we have our quadratic model. So that includes the squared term for height. And in the bottom right, we have our cubic model. That includes that cubic term for height. And now, we can talk, and probably in a future video, about how we might assess which of these models is best fitting in some sense. But just visually, uh, it seems to me that I think that rightmost, uh, bottom rightmost figure sort of looks the best. It seems to fit the data really well. Um, it seems to have very little uncertainty uh, in terms of the standard error around that line compared to the linear regression model and then compared to the quadratic model. And so somehow, just visually, that cubic model seems to fit the best. Now, I'll say, um, in my experience, that this is the only time I've ever used a cubic term, right, that is an explanatory variable cubed in an actual model. Um, generally, we limit ourselves to the quadratic terms, uh, and really the quadratic terms are just there for uh, accounting for curvature in the relationship between an explanatory variable and a response. My understanding is that in this experiment, there's actually maybe a reason, perhaps due to air resistance, why a cubic model might make sense. Uh, if you do have some of that knowledge and want to share it, feel free to comment down below. All right, in the second example we're going to talk about, uh, now we're sort of moving away from that uh, Galileo experiment, and we're going to uh, an observational study that was done uh, that counted these long-nosed dates, which I believe are a type of fish. Uh, you can head to that website to get more information. I tried to put here the relevant information. In particular, we have a response variable that's the count, that is the number of long-nosed dates that occurred in a certain segment of a stream. And we have a couple of explanatory variables that we'll look at right now, that is the maximum depth of the stream and the nitrate concentration in that stream, both of which we think would affect long-nosed dates abundance. Now, if you're familiar with Poisson regression, that's probably a better model to use here, but I'm going to use a, a multiple regression model, a linear regression model, uh, just for simplicity for demonstrating uh, some ideas here. Okay, if we think of trying to construct a multiple regression model, we might start thinking about a model that looks like this, that has two terms in it, where the response is the count of long nose days. The first xi is the maximum depth of that stream segment. And then the second explanatory variable is the nitrate concentration of that stream segment. Again, we expect both of these to be related to the response, and so it might make sense to include both of these in a multiple regression model. If we take a look at the data, right, these are the data that we see. Um, it seems like overall, yes, that there's an increase as we go from left to right from both explanatory variables in terms of the count of long nose days. Certainly it makes sense for the depth, right? If the stream is deeper, then there's just more volume of water for the fish to live in. Uh, as nitrate concentration in increases, I guess that would suggest uh, perhaps there's some biological mechanism, you can tell me down below, about why that would be related to increased long nose days count. Now you can see already though, when we include multiple explanatory variables, it's hard to sort of visualize the um, relationship between the explanatory variables and the response. And in this particular example, it seems like the relationship isn't strong for either of these explanatory variables. All right, so here is the model fit in R. You'll notice that what we do in the uh, LM statement up here is that we just include the two explanatory variables with a plus sign between them. So that is, means we're going to include nitrate, which is the NO3, and we're going to include max depth in this multiple regression model. You'll see down below that we have uh, three different lines according to the beta 0, beta 1, and beta 2, right? We can see the intercept here is that beta 0, the beta 1 is the coefficient for nitrate, and beta 2 is the coefficient here for max depth. Uh, all right, so if we take a look at the numeric quantities, that is the column that says estimate, right? That column we're going to try to give an interpretation to right now. So here is the interpretation for the intercept with the model as it was fit the expected count of long nose days when maximum depth and nitrate concentration are both zero is minus 18. Now again, this particular interpretation doesn't make a whole lot of sense. First off, we can't have a negative count, but secondly, there's not a stream if the max depth is zero, uh, and uh, right, if nitrate concentration is zero, maybe that's a biologically plausible phenomenon or not, I'm not sure. Um, so we can certainly improve on this model, or we could perhaps do the shifting the intercept in order to get a more interpretable intercept. 
for the coefficient for max depth, um, I notice now that this was not actually beta 1, this was beta 2. Um, I will probably try in the sides and just change the ordering of those explanatory variables so that they match up with these sides. Um, so remember that for every other beta, we have to hold all the other explanatory variables constant. So in this case, we're going to interpret that coefficient for max depth by saying holding nitrate concentration constant. Each centimeter increase in maximum depth is associated with an additional 0.48 long nose days counted on average. All right, so notice how we had to hold nitrate concentration constant in order to have that interpretation. Similarly, if we want to interpret the coefficient for the nitrate for NO3, then we have to hold max depth constant, and then the interpretation for this parameter is that for each milligram per liter increase in nitrate concentration, there's an expected increase of 8.3 in the long nose days count. Finally, on the previous slide, I didn't point it out, but there was a coefficient of determination, that R squared, and it was about 0.19. So that just says that the model explains 19% of the variability in the count of long nose days. All right, so that wraps up this video. The next video, we're going to be introducing the idea of uh, interactions. Hope to catch you there.